um, yeah, I'm going to talk about about the work I've been working on during my master thesis. So this is actually my first talk in the conference. So please excuse me if, if I'm a bit nervous. Um, I worked on a framework to prove strong privacy in the context of multi-agent planning. So to give a little bit of an idea about what that means, I start with a little example. We have just a planning problem with just uh, three propositions, small a, c, and e, and um, three actions, capital A, C, and E, which each make the respective uh, property true. Uh, we're just talking about one agent right now. And we have an initial state where C and E are negative and a goal state where they're both positive. So the little search tree you see below here is exactly one possible search tree that you can get from this planning tree, uh, planning problem. Now, if we say that the variable A is in this case private, we get a public problem, which looks like this, exactly the same basically, but we disregard the um, private property A. And um, now if we uh, are the sender and we use uh, some planning algorithm to solve this problem and we transmit a certain set of messages to the other agents, this might be the, the messages that we transmit and the observing agent or the, the different agent that receives the messages can look at these messages and directly see, okay, something's not right here because between the states S1 and S3 or the states S2 and S4, there's no action uh, in the public action set that I can infer here that explains um, why these messages were sent. So um, an observer can directly see, okay, uh, some private action or some private property must be active in this problem um, to explain these messages. If I use a different message sending policy, for example, from SecureMuffs, where I just ignore the um, two messages or the two states at three and at four um, and don't transmit them, then the observing agent can actually construct from the public problem um, a public search tree um, that um, explains how these messages were constructed. So in this case, um, the observer wouldn't be able to see whether uh, some private proposition was active here. Um, so to have an idea about what the um, flow of information was here, we have, um, we're basically just regarding two agents in our case. For simplicity, we have a sending agent and a receiving agent. The sending agent applies some sort of planning algorithm to get a planning tree or a search tree. Um, and part of the search tree is transmitted as messages to the receiving agent. Now the receiving agent has some sort of model of the planning algorithm that the agent, that the sending agent used. And now it can um, use its knowledge of the model and the messages and combine them to see if they are consistent or inconsistent. And if they're consistent, um, this can be either because no private variable was active um, or because the planning algorithm was um, intelligent enough to, to hide the discrepancy. Um, but if they're inconsistent, if some, some problem of course occurs here, then the receiving agent knows exactly that some private variable must have been within this planning problem. Um, we use... Um, for the definition of, of strong privacy, we use a definition from Ronan Brachman from a paper from 2015, which said a variable is strongly private if the other agents cannot deduce ex existence from the information available to them. To reformulate this a bit from the view of the observer, um, the observer ha has the base hypothesis that um, the planning problem does not contain any private variables. And what it's doing is, is that it's checking whether this hypothesis is plausible with respect to all available information. And to do this, we need some sort of common framework um, to express this whole problem. So the planning problem consists of basically four things, four sets. We have a set of propositions P that just define the valuations of the states in our problem. And then we have a set of actions in this case, Again, we only regard the actions of the sending agent, which are composed of um, a precondition, a postcondition, and some unique label for each action. Um, we have an initial state and a goal state, which are both uh, defined by some um, valuation over a subset of the propositions. 
And for our framework, we also need a set number of states. Um, sorry, in the case of this planning tree, we say um, we consider six states in this planning tree. And we want, what we want to do is we want to use propositional logic to represent this planning problem. And if we want to represent this planning problem, we basically need a set of new um, propositions over which we can set up our logic. And the set of propositions basically consists of two parts. For one thing, uh, we need to express the valuation of each state individually. So for each state, uh, we need a new set of propositions. Um, and for, for each proposition in capital P, we need one new proposition for each state. Um, and additionally, what we want to um, what we also want to express is what actions were active in the tr transformation from one state to another. So again, for each combination of states, we need another proposition that says, okay, um, as the specific action um, in uh, capital AS was active in the trans uh, transformation from um, this state to the other. So again, uh, going back to our example problem, um, we have three propositions P and we have six states. So we need, um, in this case, 18 propositions of the first kind, which uh, just say, okay, uh, in this specific state, this proposition was true or false. And we also need um, six times six. So for each combination of states, we need for each uh, action, capital A, C, and E, another proposition, which says, okay, um, between S0 and S1, for example, C was active. So uh, actually, um, already for this very limited small problem, we get um, 18 plus 108 uh, new proposition in our planning logic. Now, how can we use this framework to express a planning state or a planning tree or a set of messages? This is pretty straightforward. If we have only one state as zero, for example, we can just take the propositions that refer to the state, in this case, A as zero, C as zero, and E as zero, take the, um, the valuations of these propositions according, uh, according to this state and just do a, a conjunction. And Put them together in a conjunction. So we have here a logic formula that expresses the state of, um, of this planning tree. We had a second state as one, exactly the same way by just expanding the conjun conjunction with the prepositions that refer to as one in the, um, uh, in the correct uh, valuations. And also we need to express what action was occur uh, occurred between the states as zero and as one. In this case, this is the action capital C. So we need the preposition capital C as well as zero as one. And in this way, we can express the entire planning tree as one big conjunction over the propositions in our logic, uh, yeah, in our planning logic. Uh, we always use this um, calligraphic L to express um, a function that uh, takes a planning tree or a, a set of messages and converts them to a planning, uh, to, to a formula within the planning logic. Now, if we say, for example, the, um, again, the variable A is private and we also, uh, we only transmit the messages, that, uh, the, the states that are highlighted here, then we can do exactly the same thing to express the messages as, um, as a logic formula, just by putting the corresponding um, uh, propositions into a conjunction. Now, the second thing is how to express a planning algorithm in this framework. To see this, we have a look at a um, specific algorithm. In this case, we just expand the entire search tree as a breadth-first search. And um, while doing this, we only regard, um, we, we only expand in every state once. So if there are two paths to the same state, we only regard, we only add the first one that we encounter into the planning tree. Um, if we encounter it a second time, we just don't expand the, the state again. And to keep it entirely deterministic and have a full definition of our algorithm, we, we say that all actions are applied in alphabetical order. So. For example, if we um, start in the initial state, 
at zero, we first try to um, uh, to apply action capital A, which is not applicable in this case. Then we apply um, action capital C and add S1 to the planning tree. And next we apply action E and add S2 to the planning tree. And if we apply this algorithm, we get exactly the planning tree that we've been looking at all the time. And because this is a deterministic algorithm, we know that this is the only planning tree that we can construct with this, uh, with this algorithm. This, for example, is not a valid planning tree for this algorithm and for this problem, because we said we use a prep first search, so all successes of S3 are considered before the successes of S4. So um, S5 would not be considered as a successor of S4 in this case, even though um, the action is applicable here. Um, this also wouldn't be a valid planning tree because we only expand uh, S5 once, not as seen here twice. And uh, we also can't just swap the execution of our actions. So in this case, it looks like, or this planning tree would imply that we um, expanded as uh, the lower path first and then the upper path. This is not possible because we said we have to expand uh, the action C before the action E. So what we see here is that um, from the formulation of the algorithm follow directly a set of rules that define how the planning tree is allowed to look and what planning trees are considered valid or invalid. And what we can now do, because we are using propositional logic, we can just use axioms over our logic to limit what planning trees we consider uh, valid or not. Just to give you an idea how these axioms might look, this is uh, one possible axiom that we can construct. Um, this basically just says uh, that the, the, the entire planning tree uh, or the entire search tree is expanded. So um, to go through this, uh, we have a, uh, for every state, SK and every action, um, if the precondition of the action is applicable in this state, um, then it follows from this directly that there must be some other state as J in the planning tree, which has the um, correct valuation to act as the successor state here. It doesn't actually have to be a successor state because it might not be expanded from this path, but it has to exist somewhere in the planning tree. Or another example, um, which corresponds to the second rule, which basically says that since we expand every um, planning tree, uh, every state once, we cannot have two states in the planning tree which have the same valuation. So um, this says here for each um, two states, SK and SJ, there must be at least one proposition in capital P for which um, uh, that, that differs between the valuations, so which is positive in the first state and negative in the other or the other way around. And now what we can do to just um, to, to check whether these um, axioms and um, our messages are consistent or not, this is the only um, actual valid um, definition that I, that I included in the talk. Um, if we have um, a multi-agent planning algorithm X, and we have an axiomization um, of this algorithm that is sound and complete. Now, I didn't include the definition of sound and complete in this context uh, in the talk, but what it basically just means is that the axioms that we just defined, that we just talked about, um, actually explain or actually refer to the algorithm and the planning trees that are considered valid are exactly the the planning trees that are uh, generated by the algorithm. Um, and we have a set of messages that is transmitted during a concrete execution of this algorithm on a concrete problem, um, which we call M. And we call the algorithm publicly self-sufficient, which is just our word for this uh, framework or for this concept of um, strong privacy. Uh, if for all possible executions on all possible problems, um, the conjunction between the axioms and the logic formula that, that describes the messages is satisfiable. Um, now this 
framework has certain properties um, for once it can deal with different levels of knowledge which is, which is nice so um, if we know exactly what algorithm the other one uses and uh, the algorithm is fully defined that we can use the complete axiomization of the algorithm but it might also be that we only know that the um, the other agent is using some kind of multi-agent planning algorithm we have no idea what because maybe they just roll a dice before applying the algorithm um, then we can still we can just use a very limited set of axioms um, to define our knowledge and um, use the algorithm in this, this way for the definition it is a stronger privacy concept than pst indistinguishability for example the secure mass algorithm um, which is PSD indistinguishable, uh, can be shown that it is not publicly self-sufficient. And if we use the definition from the start, um, we can even show that um, this definition is a sufficient condition on strong privacy. It is also applicable on, for a large variety of algorithms. So if we have a different message sending policy, if we want to include, for example, the heuristic that is sent in many uh, the heuristic value of a state, which is transmitted in, in many um, algorithms that um, are based on a star, for example, then we can um, uh, implement this in the framework. And another nice thing, uh, if we have a concrete um, execution of this algorithm, so we have one set of, um, of messages um, and we have pre-compiled the, the axioms, then we can test, we can just throw the whole thing into the sub solver and test whether this con concrete problem um, leaked some sort of private information, which could, for example, be used in, in a comp competition. Uh, we can use this framework to formally prove whether an algorithm is always uh, private, but we can, or is private under a certain circumstances, for example, for a certain subset of, of problems. But we can also use it, um, for example, algorithmically to check whether a single execution of this algorithm uh, is private. Or even if we want, we can use it during the execution of the algorithm to see, OK, um, my next step would be to send this message. Uh, do I leak some privacy in this case? And it gives us new insight into the problem of privacy and the uh, full paper, I give some arguments for um, um, how this, um, or how, how we can see from this uh, that a randomized algorithm, for example, might solve some privacy problems in this case, because um, for a randomized algorithm, we can only generate a very limited set of axioms um, that just define this algorithm. Um, so we, yeah. Um, and um, one last thing, we can even use it as the receiving agent, as an observer, uh, to see whether the um, the sending agent leaked some privacy in its messages, um, basically by using it the same way. Um, 